The Fairs of Etymology presents The Masonic Zombie Brides, a cautionary tale of the kindness of strangers. It speaks of the darkest matrimonial catastrophe ever to blight the otherwise quite nondescript land of Wackenville. It is here that the Reverend Mr. Bentley keeps house, lives well and happily in peace, and wonderfully increases his possessions. He is a boring man, but pleasant, and is accordingly about to receive a by contrast interesting visitor. At this moment, he is going about his ablutions. Now I smell the soap which has so protected me. Yes. Now to put away my soap. There we go. And answer that blessed door. Mr. Bentley away! Coming, ready or not? Beyond the door stood a loose gentleman in a slippery topper and a suit of silk who introduced himself as... Gabriel Pigeon's the name. Leisure's the game. Why, you look so familiar that I feel that we must be old friends. My, this is a big house. How might I be of assistance? Is it about the jumble sale for the Feast of St. Baal? The anti-cub scout march? Or even the jumble sale for the Feast of St. Baal? No, no, it is not. Instead, I make a gift to you. It is in recognition of all your years of ageing. A present for me? No, no, you must be mistaking me for the Count of Wackenfeld, or even a small child with a lonely birthday. Truly, sir, are you an angel? Naturally. The gift is... Bring it here, Smith! <coughs> this water is so heavy, I could eat my head. We present the wardrobe of Babylon. The wood is said to have been carved from the rock of Mount Rushmore. Oh. But the hinges, they were carved here in Wackenfeld, formed from the very liquid wax of the last dying candle of the night of the long night. Oh, that's all right, then. And it is yours for free, forever, on one condition, that you never look within. Think of it. You could show its exterior to the bishop claiming that you owned more clothes than those in which you are now so gaily clad. He might even promote you to Admiral. Think of that, Reverend. You could sail the seven seas. Well, that's really very nice of you, Lord Pigeon, but I'm not sure I have anything I can offer you in return. Don't worry about it. The smile on your little face is a reward in itself. Oh. Bring it in, Master Smith. Poor fellows carried it from Shetland. It can sit in my bedchamber next to my cupboard of Baghdad. No! It must sit in your ballroom. Alas, I lack such a facility, and it would look rather splendid by my lampshade collection. Then bring that flim flammery to your dining hall, for it must on no account be placed in your bedroom, or it will be on ley lines. Oh, for goodness sake, whatever is wrong with ley lines now? Rather too much magnetism. The screws will fall out. Very well, bring it in then. And bring it in they did, huffing and puffing all the while, finally laying it to rest between the twin portraits of Caesar Nero and Johnny Ringo. I see you are a patron of the arts. Perhaps I was rash in declining your money. To think I brought it all the way here for a magic bean. I hope I'll never see it again. The bean or the wardrobe? The bean didn't fill me up at all. And they say the wardrobe has a terrible curse. Well, so long. A curse? Dear me. Well, I, uh... We'll show ourselves out, Reverend. Well, in that case, I'll go and do a poo. If you get lost, the bathroom's on the third landing, but the front door is at the start of the house. Five minutes later, Mr. Bentley's bathroom receives a knock at the door. Come in, come in. Begging your pardon, Millard, but after I said goodbye to Lord Pigeon, I remembered that I'm a penniless hobo. Might I trouble you for a shiny sixpence... Or even a place to stay. I could shine your shoes and socks and button your shirt. Heck, I could do anything. Well, my shirt is buttoned already, and I can't really foresee a time that this will change. <laughs> oh. Oh, come now, come now, Master Smith. Surely we can come to some arrangement. Uh, I, 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 could, I could be your living chimney sweep. They say that's good luck. Very well, you may live in my chimney. I believe there's a rook's <laughs> nest in there, and if you can evict the current occupants, you may live in there for a pound an hour. Fair enough. And I'll clean the chimneys for a pound an hour. That way, so long as I never rest or sleep, I can break even. And everybody wins. Good night, Mr Smith. Good night, sir. And, uh, sir... Mm -hmm. 
I hope you don't mind, but I snore. And that was the end of Wednesday. Or was it? The following morning revealed debris indicative of certain nocturnal doings and deeds. Hello, what's this? The seat of my water closet is very nearly vertical. Smith! Mr. Smith! Hello? I should like to know the meaning of this. Ooh! What? The lavatory. The seat has been misappropriated, and here someone has reversed the positioning of the loo roll that it might hang down toward the wall. The bastard! You and I, Smith, are the only occupants of this mansion. So if it wasn't me, it must have been... I should never act so recklessly. Already today I've discovered all my clocks smashed and my brandy cellars drunk dry. That can't have been me because I'm such an affable sort. This really is too much, Mr. Smith. Well, it can't have been me, because if I did, you would fire me. Well, in that case, I can't, and you're to stay on as my chimney shine boy. Smith worked with a guilty diligence that afternoon, removing soot, nests, bricks, smoke and chimney pots from each of the mansion's chimneys, never offering complaint as each was lit beneath him by an absent-minded Bentley. Now, I don't want to see any smoke coming out of the top of my chimneys, or I shall be forced to detonate certain devices collapsing them around you. No, the door! So Smith scrubbed the very particles of the air as clean as a whistle and as loud as soap. Eventually, in turn, Thursday concluded. But Mr. Bentley was distrustful of his new lodger and observed him all the while through night vision goggles. Phew! I think he's gone to bed! Woohoo! Now to get down some serious skiving! First off, my exercises. I knew it. Limbering up for the villainies of night. And stretch one, pull one, eat one, knit one. Hey, what's he asked? Steal one, clean one, fob one, swab one. <sighs> Come on, Smith, old boy, make your move. <laughs> what jokes! <laughs> and Bentley stared all night as Smith sung, chuckled, and merrily exclaimed. But in the morning, tired and bored, though Smith had made no move from his chimney hole, Bentley once more found the house in a conspicuous disarray. Pencils. Would you take a look at this, Mr. B? Someone's gone and dug a hole in the middle of your dining room table. Now who do a thing like that? Makes the mind boggle. My breakfast has all been eaten, and look, somebody's already read the morning papers. They're worse than useless. Oh, this truly is a black day. Well, if it wasn't you... And it wasn't me. Mr. Smith, have you ever heard of such a thing as a ghost? I never have. Don't tell me. Or I'll be all you feared. Are they like the Yeti? You have so much to learn. I must tell you, I, I must. Once, long ago, there lived a sorcerer named Simon Ghost, who had a fantastic invention that only he knew about. It all began far off in distant Himalay near the Jebela Suble, when Simon Ghost excavated the long-lost tomb of King Solomon's mines, only to find the mines were not as dead as history had promised. Rather, they were frozen in time from beyond the grave. I believe one of those mines may be living in our house, and by living I mean dead, and by dead I mean a ghost. Oh, those ghosts! Yes, that would explain all of this ectoplasm. Tastes sort of... Marmalady. Lemony ghost! Oh, the very worst kind. It's just as I had feared. Let's call the vicar. Vicar! Oh, yes! That's me! Hmm. Then we must follow the trail. And wherever it leads us, we must traipse. If it takes us to the end of a rainbow, we'll win a crotch of gold, but still we shall trundle on. OK, then. Round these chairs, through the doors, up the stairs, down the elevator shaft, up the chimney down, down the chimney up, all around the racket rock, the racket rascal run. Right, then. Let's start following this trail of debris and damage. Oh, it leads to my wardrobe. Well, that's my job done. You go and look inside, Master Smith. I have a look myself, but I've got to turn around and investigate something, well, anything else. Very well. I shall do it. But if they haunt me dead, I'd better get a beautiful funeral with flowers and a mourner and be made an honorary vicar. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Now run along. Yeah. 
knock, knock, who's there? Come out, come out, whatever you are. Go away, Master Smith. He must not know we're living in his wardrobe. Lord Pigeon, I didn't know you were a King Solomon's mine. I am no such thing, remember? This was our clever plan. My fellows and I are to hide in this wardrobe, and Mr Bentley must not discover us. Make up a clever lie, and I'll protect your terrible secret. What secret? Precisely. Goodbye. But what did the ghosts have to say? There are no ghosts. There's just a lot of coats inside, with people in them. What he meant to say... Gabriel Pigeon, you've been sleeping in my wardrobe. Are you in league with the ghosts who plague us? Revered, Mr Charles Bentley. Surely you, of all people, vicar of Wackenfeld, should not fear such a thing as a ghost. Dear boy, dear boy, you have nothing at all to worry about. Let me tell you a tale. Long, long ago, a man named Sir Albert Finney bought a hairbrush from a charity shop. Little did he suspect that it had been in a coffin with an old dead corpse for precisely 666 years. Now, he bought this hairbrush, and for the next 900 lunar cycles, it came alive at night and brushed the hair of murderers, making them more presentable at their trials, thus increasing their chances of getting released to commit more sins and mortally destructive criminal acts. So you see, Mr. Bentley, comparatively, you have nothing to worry about here. What's an abstract fear of something going to do for your constitution? Break it, that's what! Now, if you don't mind, I shall return to the warmth and comfort of your wardrobe, and you will get on with your daily life, free from worry about ghosts and murder and the undead, and transfer your concerns to Master Smith. Can you trust him? Maybe. Maybe. Good night. Well, that clears that up, then. You don't know anything about this, do you, Smith? No. Well then, that's fine. Let's go and watch a video. And so they did, but this was not to be the end of their concerns. Let us, however, transfer our attention many hours forward into the wardrobe of Babylon. You're sitting on my external limbs, all of you. What's the hour? Is it time to get out of this bloody wardrobe? A quarter until midnight. Less thirty seconds. Let us emerge. Gentiles, our night's work begins. <clears throat> night seven of our scheming, and we have much to accomplish. I can't bear it any longer. Everybody, out into the hall. We have only one more day to spend in this accursed furniture, and then we shall be happily ever after all. And now that night is upon us, we may savour the space of Bentley's house. Everybody out! All right, roll call. Oh, okay. Gabriel Pigeon. Present and correct. Eric Theatre. Yes, that's me. The Priest of Sanctifex. At your service. Bello Bobbins. I should say all here. Simon Dolliver. Present. Richard Rivington Wells. I'm here. Snakey McGoof. Snakey present. Gary Nixon. Hi! That's our lot. Now we proudly present the seventh and penultimate meeting of the Bride Finder Octet. <laughs> right on. As you know, we are a mere 24 hours and a quarter from time zero. Now our host, Charles Bentley, has noticed some of our more festive nocturnal bumblings, and I fear we must act with caution and surprise if we are not to alarm him beyond contentment. Now, where did we leave off yesterday evening? I was preparing the blood of Octigentesimus. And I was stain proofing the steel. We have six of the eight elements of life, but still we require pure frankincense and felt. Bolivar and Magus, you are to dispatch to the vestry of the Forgotten Vests, which is by the toilet on the third floor landing, and seek out what you may find. Be sure to return before the clock strikes anything. What are we to do while we await their return? 
Let us count to eight in preparation. One, two... Wait! Are you sure? Why would such people count to eight? I hear you cry. Here is a policeman to explain its very special significance. When I count to eight, I remember my eighth birthday. I got a cake with eight candles and suddenly it all made sense to me. Eight is two cubed. That's eight times eight. Or eight to the power of eight for your mathematics specialists out there. How am I doing, narrator? Jolly well. Back in Bentley's Hall, the priest of Sanctifex reaches the final Six, desperate number in his list. Seven, eight. Now what? Five minutes until midnight. I believe there is still a timepiece in the house. And if we can destroy it, midnight, the time where time is not, should last eight minutes longer. Long enough to practice our specialist movements. But why midnight? Couldn't we just use the time between 12 and 12.08 for the same activities? By no means! You forget that the word midnight is the Latin number for the number 8 o'clock, just as 8 is the Greek number for infinity, which is the number in which we have a one in chance of success. I do like those odds. Bobbins, Nixon and Rivington Wells, seek out and destruct the final clock in the house. Here is the clock detector. <laughs> and we shall practice our counting. All together now. One and two and three and four. Careful there. And six and seven. Wait. Stop this counting. Uh, you're busted. No, I'm the master of the house. And the master of the smith. Gentlemen, what are you doing in my house so late at night? Tell me, are you the bogeyman? Only by reputation. I am the priest of sacrifice. Then this pool of blood is excused. What is the reason for this unmannerly interruption? Don't you know we are the Bride Seeker Octet and have official business ongoing? What is your reason for being awake at such an hour? And in your own home, for goodness sake! I told on you! Yes. It was all rather confusing, actually. So if you could give a more linear explanation, it would all make much more sense. Am I to understand that you gentlemen wish to become... Freemasons. A freedom which we richly deserve, but cannot by conventional means seem to gain. It is ours by an audacious plot and infallible. I say, may I join you? I've always rather enjoyed rolling and unrolling trousers. Bah! The only way we would let you into the Bride Seeker Octet would be if you were Masons already, in which case you would have no need to join. But, uh, we are Freemasons already, aren't we, Master Smith? Aren't we, Master Smith? Uh, uh, yes, sir, no. Of course we are, sir. I'll believe it when you prove it. Um, uh... uh, uh, uh okay, yeah. Uh, did you know that pencil is the secret Freemason word for yes? Is that true? Uh, can it be? Well, I didn't know that, so it must be a real Masonic truth, because I was never a Mason, Miss. Well, in that case, Bolivar and Magoose make too, too many for the octet. <laughs> but now we are down to eight once more. But why do you need eight of us? How can that possibly help us to become Freemasons? Gather round and I shall tell you the tale. But brace yourselves, for it is very complicated and very long and very terrifying. Oh, no. In a long-forgotten plot in St. Baal's graveyard and grave emporium lies the tomb of the Masons. Eight sisters lie there, each a virgin, and each descended from screen actor James Mason. In two days' time, it is the 888th anniversary of the doom of Octidentesimus, who cursed him all to death, and who, as you well know, was the 800th evil wizard ever. Oh, my. If, on this most eightful of anniversaries, we can break the curse and raise each young Miss Mason to life, we win the right to marry them. And, by ancient Wackenfeldian tradition, assume their surnames and become Masons by default. 
Meaning trouser legs and wine all round. But how can you hope to raise them to life? As priest of Sanctifex, I have learnt more frightful secrets and more alarming cures and fiendish magics than any man in eight generations. I believe we have discovered the eight elements of life. The eight elements of life? But those are just a legend. No, not a legend, man of cloth. They're so real that we've already got them. Here they are in alphabetical order. Stainless steel, felt, uranium, blood... Midnight, gold, frankincense and marmalade. Eight brides, eight elements. We must merely deduce which element to place in the mouth of which bride. We have one minute of midnight to try out all 512 possible combinations. But this increases to eight minutes if we break every clock in the tomb. Gosh, well... That plan certainly does sound quite infallible. Two days more to practice our digging and our eight times tables. Two days until the 8th of October, the first of Octodentesimus, or Eightmus for short. But wait a minute. Because you work at night, midnight is the first minute of the day, that means you only have 24 hours. That's half the time we need. But on the other hand, we shall be fully-fledged fellow crafts in the Wackenfeldian Lodge. Oh, happy day. Twenty-three hours and thirty minutes pass. All is prepared, and through the mists of the cool October night, the octet advances, each in his best wedding suit with aprons at the ready. In this place, eight hundred and eighty-eight years ago tonight, a work of evil was committed. High moral standards amongst the nation's virgins meant that childbirth was at an all-time low. An evil wizard was summoned by consensus of the Parliament of Wackenfeld to place a curse that would render dead all virgins to weed out those causing this dearth of newborns. A curse which could only be lifted by the bringing together of these eight items. Lord! Marmalade! Midnight felt! A butter! Raw sausages! Apple turtle! And my hat! The curse backfired on virginal octogentesimus, who likewise perishing, swore that if the virgins were not raised to life within eight thousand years, he would return from beyond the grave to take his revenge on every man and woman and child to have been born by childbirth, setting each of them alight! Our brotherhood owes it to the future to marry these Masonic brides and thus enter an advantageous fraternity from which yet greater works may be done. Here is the tomb. Here lie the eight sisters, burial tude, Sissy, Belinda, Hilary, Pickwick, Marie, Gertrude Stein, Windeline, and Medusa. Oh, it's, uh, it's locked. Did anybody bring a key? Well, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not to that. It's in my house. Front door. In fact, since they are entombed rather than buried, why did you do so much digging practice? I have an idea. Master Smith, dig up the grave. Uh, that one there. Here lies Dr. Arius Pelmet. I had no idea he was dead. The tragedy of death reaches all who fail to escape it. Nonetheless, we require a skeleton key. Get digging, all of you. We have a mere 25 minutes in which to dig the grave, enter the tomb, and reach the bodies. This should allow us sufficient time to attempt the 256 of our planned arrangements, giving us a 50% chance of success. We cannot give up at this stage. We cannot give up. Oh, no! Reverend Bentley, might I speak a word in your ear? Certainly. What is it, Lord P? I have just remembered a very terrible thing. May I tell you a secret which, until now, hope and enthusiasms and some small measure of brandy has shielded from mine the mind that devised it. Fire away. The others must not hear. The octet was formed as a ploy to live in a cupboard in your house and eat your food. And suppose some remorse resides in my heart, as I feel compelled to tell you. There was no octogentesimus. There was no curse. The tale of the brides was a lie. The lie that made these men my friends. They did everything I told them to do. Only in their estimation am I lord. What is to become of me when the truth appears? Don't be silly, Lord Pigeon. It's just nerves. Quite natural on one's wedding day. 
And the tale of a curse may be a lie to you, but it sure enough gave me the willies, so maybe there's something in it. My granny taught me never to abandon a foolish endeavor halfway through. Who knows? Perhaps your attempt to tell a lie uncovered some unholy truth, and corpses will rise at midnight. I certainly hope so. We have the skeleton key, and it fits the lock. The tomb is open. After you, Lord Pigeon. Sanctifex, I, I have something to tell you. Oh, no, you don't. Stealing old Smithy's limelight. I have a confession first, and an even bigger one than you. So there. That's right. I told a fib. I'm not a Freemason at all. I'm not even free. And I don't even like any of you people. What you're doing is wrong, and wrong is evil. Virgins, for goodness sake. Don't listen to him. He's trying to swerve us from our next real Mancy, and I'll not be having that. Bury him in the open grave. No! You wouldn't! Oh, no! Oh! Well, thank goodness all that proclaiming is over. Tell you what, you can have his bride as a spare, Lord P. What was it you were going to say, my liege? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing? And look, here are the brides. Gosh, I'm sure they look pretty 888 years ago. I wouldn't count on it. Perhaps those were the days of living skellingtons. Well then, time is pressing on. Let us pop the elements in their mouths and see what happens. Okay, now, there we go. Ah. Yeah. Well, I don't believe it. They're moving. Can it be that you have the combination right first time? Eric, you're the mathematician. What were the odds? One in eight? One in eighty-eight. You're both right. Hush! Our new brides arise! In an archaeological sort of way, you're more beautiful, Marielle. Listen, they're trying to say something. Oh, no! After so long dead, they're... Zombies! Oh, I should have realized! I should have realized! The door is stuck! I can't get out! I can't get out! Six feet beneath this catastrophe, in a cold, cold grave, Master Smith lies. Lucky thing there was a coffin in your grave, eh, Dr. Pelmet? What's that, Dr. Pelmet? You can hear screaming from up above? The brides are zombies, you say? Well, who didn't see that coming? Looks like it's time for old Master Smith to save the day! Again. And so Master Smith tore himself from the grave. Please get away from us! Please! Please! Yeah, we're all terrified. Just one cotton picking moment! I have risen from the grave, therefore I must be dead. Yes? So, ladies, will you all marry me? You can't do that. It's quiet, Eric. He's saving our lives. Do the honours, Mr. Bentley. Uh, um, uh, uh, do you, Miss Mason, take this Master Smith to be your awful wedded husband? We do. Uh, I'm not sure this is quite right, but... Do you, Master Smith, take these women? All of them, uh... Sure I do! See, now I'm eight masons, all at once. You may now kiss the zombie brides. That's a... Stop! Police! We have your tomb surrounded! What's happening? of mass bigamy. Are these the culprits? Yes. All these dead ladies and this horrid little man. Right. You lot, get into the car. All of you. You can't do this to me. You're coming away to the state penitentiary. No, I'm not. I'm not going anywhere. You can't do this to me. I'm a free man. What the hell was I supposed to be? Phew. Well, that's the end of the Masonic zombie brides and of Master Smith. What do you suppose will happen to them? Bigamy is punishable by life imprisonment. 
which, when you are already dead, lasts for eternity. Or 888 more years, if you are well behaved. <sighs> Whoa! That's that done and dusted. Just a minute. Why weren't you taken to prison? Oh, I just gave the police officer a very special handshake. You forget, I'm now Master Mason, and you must all obey me. Then you can initiate us as entered apprentices of Freemasonry, and our plan will have been a success. No, you buried me in a grave. And if we hadn't, you'd be dead with the rest of us. So in a way, we did you a favour. No! I utterly, utterly refuse. You'll never be mentioned why I have any say in it, and I do. Well, uh, I never really wanted to be a mason anyway. Neither did I. Whose idea was this stupid Freemasonry? It was Master Smith's idea. He just wanted to be cool, but he is not. And he is not even in the Bride Seeker Septet. And we all are. So let's go back to Mr. Bentley's house and have a fondue. Yes, yes let's, let's do that. that. Ooh, can I come? Fondue is my very, very favourite. No, you cannot. And you're not our friend and your handshake won't work on us. And it's past your bedtime. Oh, and you're fired. Come on, everybody else. Let's go home. And we can watch videos and eat biscuits and maybe even have a little fizzy pop. And I think I have a bouncy castle hidden somewhere and a oh, trampoline. I don't need them anyway. I could be a mason all on my own. I'll just roll up my trouser legs and... Oh, no. I'm wearing shorts. All right, then. I'll roll up my legs and... And as Master Smith once more realises that he is alone in the world, so ends the true story of the Masonic Zombie Bride. Just as Smith grows shorter and colder with each passing tear, so Bentley, Pigeon, Sanctifex, Theatre et al. keep house, live well and happily in peace, and wonderfully increase their possessions. Good night. <laughs>